Hi, my name is Sharon Chen, and I'm a pediatric infectious disease physician at Stanford University. In this video, I'll tell you about Helicobacter pylori, a bacterium that was discovered 30 years ago and is associated with two major chronic diseases of humans, which were not originally thought to be infectious. These two chronic diseases are ulcers of the stomach and gastric cancer. Our learning objectives are to discuss the role of bacteria in causing complex chronic diseases like duodenal and gastric ulcers and stomach cancers, to explain the current concepts on the epidemiology and transmission of Helicobacter pylori infection, and to explain the evolutionary relationship between H. pylori and humans and some of its potential benefits. Helicobacter pylori is the most common bacterial infection of humans. It colonizes the stomach in half of the world's population. As a comparison, tuberculosis infects a third of the world. Both of these bacteria are human-specific pathogens. Although Helicobacter pylori infection is so common, most people are asymptomatic and will not develop disease. One of the diseases that people can develop from H. pylori infection is ulcers. These are non-healing wounds in the proximal duodenum or in the gastric mucosa, so specifically these are called peptic ulcers. They develop in about 15% of people who are infected with H. pylori. This turns out to be a very large number of people. In the U.S. alone, we treat about 5 million cases of ulcers each year. In the drawing of the stomach that you can see, um, there's a duodenal ulcer that's circled, and the video shows you an endoscopic view of the distal part of the stomach moving then into the duodenum, where you can start to see a crater-like lesion with bleeding from the center. That's the ulcer. H. pylori is also associated with another disease, gastric cancer. The good news is that only 1% of infected people will develop gastric cancer, the bad news is that this is still a very large number of people. Gastric cancer is the third leading cause of cancer death worldwide. The image at the top shows you a very advanced gastric adenocarcinoma that has grown in a fungus-like manner into the stomach and eventually caused an obstruction. Gastric cancer is very difficult to treat, and unfortunately, it's often asymptomatic until it is in advanced stages. Let's now talk a bit about ulcers. So how can ulcers be due to an infection? You might have heard that ulcers are due to stress. In fact, up until the 1980s, physicians learned that ulcers were due to ex excess stomach acid, diet, and stress. Thus, the treatment was anti-acid medications, bland foods, and a vacation. These interventions improved the symptoms, but rarely cured the ulcers. So this meant that the ulcers worsened or relapsed when anti-acid medications, for example, were stopped. Sometimes, ulcers that worsened resulted in serious complications, including bleeding, gastric perforation, or even death. In 1984, Robin Warren and Barry Marshall described a new bacterium that they were able to culture from gastric biopsies. The detection of this bacterium was significantly higher in patients with gastritis and ulcers. Their finding was controversial, and few people believe that this bacterium caused ulcers. We now know this microbe as Helicobacter pylori. Initially, they named it Campylobacter pylori because it looks morphologically like Campylobacter. This is the bacterium that causes diarrhea. It turns out that they are related to each other, but different enough for the bacterium to be in its own genus, thus the name change. Helicobacter was chosen because of its helical or spiral shape. Pylori was chosen because the bacterium's preferred location is the distal end of the stomach, the pylorus. The picture shows you a scanning electron micro micrograph of an H. pylori bacterium. You can see its spiral shape and a tuft of flagella at one end. It uses this for swimming. H. pylori is a gram-negative bacterium that requires low oxygen conditions, and it divides more slowly compared to the typical gut bacterium. Here's our pathogen list, and you can see that Campylobacter and Helicobacter are grouped as spiral gram-negative bacteria. In terms of phylogeny, you can see that Campylobacter and Helicobacter branch out of the phylum proteobacteria. They are part of the class Epsilon proteobacteria. In comparison, other enteric gram-negative bacteria you might have heard about, like E. coli, Salmonella, or Shigella, are part of the Gamma proteobacteria. All right, so how do we know that H. pylori causes ulcers, and it's not just some innocent bystander? Well, this took years to answer. 
There are three main pieces of evidence that eventually convinced the medical world. First, treatment with antibiotics eradicated bacteria from the stomach and also cured ulcers. Additionally, when antibiotics failed, the result was often a relapse of an ulcer. A second piece of evidence was from experimental infections on humans. In fact, Dr. Barry Marshall drank a culture of live H. pylori and developed symptoms and histological evidence of acute gastritis. He was treated with antibiotics before he developed an ulcer. Third, a number of reports have demonstrated accidental infections. H. pylori contaminated endoscopes transfer the bacteria from an infected person to an uninfected person who subsequently develops an ulcer. After many years of controversy, the accumulated data led to changes in how physicians treated ulcers. It's now based on the idea that it's an infectious disease. In 2005, Marshall and Warren were awarded the Nobel Prize for their discovery. Now let's talk about the other H. pylori associated disease, gastric cancer. In this case, it's been more difficult to make a connection between microbe and disease, but clinically it's very important because a causal relationship would suggest that controlling H. pylori infection can minimize gastric cancer. You may not have heard much about gastric cancer, so I want to give you a sense of its significant impact worldwide. Epidemiology data from 2012 lists gastric cancer as the fifth most common cancer worldwide, and it's one of the deadliest, ranked at number three. As you can see on the map, the countries with the darkest blue have the highest incidence. It is most problematic in Asia and certain parts of Latin America. Before 1975, it was the most common cancer worldwide. The incidence has dropped over time, su suggesting a strong environmental factor. Currently, there are about a million new cases of gastric cancer each year. About 700,000 people die of gastric cancer every year worldwide. So how do we know that H. pylori is implicated in gastric cancer? Well, the evidence is based on numerous epidemiology studies. They have shown a significant association between H. pylori infection and gastric cancer and with pre-malignant lesions in the stomach that progress to cancer. In fact, the risk of getting gastric cancer from H. pylori can be as high as the risk of getting lung cancer from smoking. Because of all this data, H. pylori is defined as a definitive carcinogen by the World Health Organization. Here's an example of this cancer. The video shows you an endoscopic view of a gastric adenocarcinoma that has started to infiltrate the pylorus. This patient, unfortunately, had to have half of her stomach removed. How is H. pylori transmitted? Surprisingly, this is not very well understood. There are some clues from epidemiology studies. The map shows you the prevalence rates in different parts of the world. You can see that the more developed countries have a lower prevalence rate compared to the less developed countries. Some of these countries, the prevalence rate reaches 90%. Unlike the other major GI infectious agents, which are transmitted by contaminated food and can infect large numbers of populations, H. pylori is transmitted within families. Close contact is necessary, and logically, overcrowding is a risk factor. Epidemiology studies show transmission from mother to child or sibling to sibling. The only experimental evidence of transmission of H. pylori is that it can be readily cultured from vomitus but not from feces. This suggests transmission by gastric oral or oral oral routes, but maybe not fecal oral. There is no environmental reservoir. Epidemiology studies also suggest that H. pylori has infected humans for a very long time. In fact, when people take H. pylori strains from diverse populations around the world and compare their genetic sequences, they find that H. pylori strains are very genetically diverse. In fact, the diverse H. pylori strains can serve as a map of different human populations and follows the pattern of human migration throughout human evolution. From these studies, H. pylori has co-evolved with humans for at least 60,000 years since humans migrated out of Africa. Mummies have been found with H. pylori in their stomachs. One other point, the genetically diverse strains of H. pylori is more evidence that H. pylori doesn't spread through environmental reservoirs because the strains would have likely mixed over time. So let me summarize. Here is the world according to H. pylori in this one diagram. It's divided into people who are infected and people who are not. The circle shows the 50% of the world who are infected. 
10 to 15 percent of those people will develop ulcers. Almost all the duodenal ulcers are due to H. pylori. A large number of gastric ulcers are due to H. pylori, but as you can see from the Venn diagram, some are not. These others may be due to other insults like non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications or steroids. About 1% of infected people will develop some kind of cancer, the most common being gastric adenocarcinoma. H. pylori accounts for about 70% of these cancers. There's a very rare form of cancer called gastric lymphoma. It sources lymphocytes in the mucosa, not the epithelium. Although rare, this cancer is almost always due to H. pylori. Knowing this association is clinically important because treating the H. pylori infection can sometimes resolve the cancer without chemotherapy. Now to make things more interesting, we, know, we now know that treating everyone and eradicating H. pylori may not be a completely wise thing to do. As you can imagine, the long evolution between pathogen and host might have resulted in beneficial outcomes. For example, epidemiology studies show an inverse relationship between some types of cancer, like esophageal carcinoma and H. pylori. It's thought that H. pylori infection reduces the acid in the stomach, which is the main source of damage to the esophagus during reflux disease. H. pylori also has complex interactions with your immune system. As we will discuss later, H. pylori can evade your immune system to remain persistent in your body. Some studies have shown an inverse relationship between H. pylori and autoimmune disorders such as childhood asthma. Lastly, a chronic inflammatory state may protect us from other infections. For example, people infected with H. pylori have stronger responses against mycobacterium tuberculosis. Well, if we shouldn't treat everyone, who needs to be treated for H. pylori? The answer is not completely known. Everyone with a stomach ulcer and H. pylori should be treated and people with a family history of gastric cancer should also be treated. But the relationship between H. pylori and humans is complex. One proposal is that H. pylori may be beneficial because it protects us from other infections, but then at some point having a gut infection is costly to our bodies and results in diseases like ulcers and cancer. There are some extra intestinal diseases that have been associated with H. pylori that need further investigation. For example, some cases of anemia or low platelet counts resolve after H. pylori treatment.